Good evening. We begin tonight with multiple late breaking stories. The first happening on the city's northeast side in the 15,000 block of Topper Wine. Details are limited right now, but police say one man has been taken to the hospital with a gunshot wound at the chest. Another man reportedly injured and taken to the hospital as well, but not much else is known right now. Police on the scene tell us both men appear to be in their 20s. No word on any suspects. This story is developing. We'll continue to update you as we learn more. Also tonight, three people are severely injured following a two vehicle crash on Highway 181 near Kilowatt in Southeast Bear County. Deputies say they don't have many details about the crash because there were no witnesses at the scene. But when they got there, one of the victims was unconscious and firefighters had to cut another out of a vehicle. One victim was airlifted to University Hospital, two others taken to a hospital in serious condition. Northbound lanes at 1604 will be closed while crime scene and traffic safety units investigate the crash. Let's take a quick look at our COVID-19 local update right now. City officials reporting 108 new cases tonight and 2,473 backlog cases. In addition, two new deaths within the last 14 days were also confirmed today. Meanwhile, hospitalizations increased to 225 today. One of those of those patients, rather, 92 are in the ICU and 45 are on ventilators. I did not want to close my eyes because I was just terrified of not ever opening up my eyes again. For the first time since he was shot by a wanted man in Comal County, a sheriff's deputy, Eddie Luna, is sharing his story. We've reported about Deputy Luna as his community has worked to raise money to help with his recovery. His injury happened exactly one month ago today, and he tells the night team's Jaffney Gray he's not letting this setback stop him from wearing his badge. I didn't, I didn't even hear the blast, but I saw the shotgun. I saw the blast because I saw the flame. August 20th, life changed forever for Kamau County Deputy Eddie Luna. While serving a felony arrest warrant to this man, he was shot nearly at point blank range. I didn't know I had gotten hit until I actually ran around and I took a position to, I need to get out of here position because I looked down and I saw the damage that was to my arm. He says by the grace of God, his younger brother, Deputy Rene Luna, was there to get him to safety. And I need for you to apply a tourniquet like ASAP because I could feel literally feel my blood coming out of my body and he did that in the best way that he could he took a deep breath and i know it was a tough deal for 26 days luna was in the hospital his wife by his side the entire time as he underwent 12 surgeries he ultimately had to make the decision to amputate part of his right arm what they told me you know was going to give me 40 to 50 percent movement at best and that's, you know, with taking bones out of my legs and muscles out of my thighs. This past Tuesday, Luna was discharged from the hospital and was honorably escorted home. Yeah, it was incredible to see all the civilians, all the American flags, all the um, all the police officers. He served 29 years with the sheriff's office and says he plans to continue to serve and protect his community. And the incident was, you know, terrible and horrible what I went through. But is it uh, hasn't scared me in one way. You know, I'm coming back. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Good to see. We wish him well as he continues to recover. Other top stories we're following tonight. Human remains found inside a stolen vehicle set on fire this morning on Bear County's west side. San Antonio police making that discovery while responding to a report of a stolen vehicle in the 6600 block of Calle Duarte. The vehicle was found completely burned and police say they also found skeletal remains inside. Investigators were still on scene as of this afternoon. The victim's ID has not yet been determined. Flames severely damaged a Dollar General store on the southwest side this afternoon. The fire started just after 2 p.m. at the store on Old Pearsall Road. Firefighters on scene say they saw smoke coming from the front of the building. And when they made, they were, made their way towards the back of the store, they found the storage area fully engulfed in flames. No injuries were reported and the cause of the fire is still unknown. The man is in critical condition tonight after police say he was stabbed during an attack on the north side overnight. This happened in the 900 block of Mulberry Avenue. Police say the victim came home with multiple stab wounds and then called 911. The man who police say is in his early 30s was then transported to the hospital. Details of the stabbing are unknown, but police say they are questioning several witnesses. Police say they have one person in custody and are still searching for another in a suspected drunk driving crash overnight. It happened on Highway 281 around 3 a.m. Police say the driver lost control and rolled several times before landing on a wall divider. 
The driver and passenger ran from the scene. Officers were able to catch up to the driver who could now face a DWI charge. Another big story we're tracking tonight. Another storm as the Texas Gulf Coast begins to feel the force of Tropical Storm Beta. Residents are hoping for the best. Port O'Connor has already seen some flooding in parts of the community today as the storm makes its way inland. The night team Stephen Cavazos was there today and spoke with some people who are bracing for the unknown. Preparing for storms has become routine for residents here in Port O'Connor. But part-time resident David Rogers isn't too concerned with the damage Tropical Storm Beta could bring. Well, it's going to cause it somewhere on the coast, and I've never lived over a few blocks away from water in my life. Rogers says he's prepared, but tells us he's weathered bigger storms and hurricanes in his lifetime. I don't see this as a big risk at all. The tropical storm causing a stir up in the ocean as water makes its way inland, consuming parts of the beach here in Port O'Connor. Other parts of the community also seen flooding. We spoke to resident Cindy Hansen earlier Sunday. That's what you see typically as the tides start to rise and that's your first sign that you're getting a storm. Her home sits along the waterfront. It's where she and her husband have lived for almost 10 years. She says many of her neighbors left. The couple plan to hunker down, but Hansen says plans could always change. We would not stay if it was really bad. We wouldn't. We would leave. We also met John Casey and his it's wife. Casey says beta isn't enough to scare him away. I would leave, but there's a lot of people that says they're not going to. But Casey says residents are here for one another. Well, that's what we do around here. We look out for one another. Now, these residents don't believe that beta is going to cause much damage here in the area, but many say that the coast community has seen worse in its lifetime. Several referenced Hurricane Carla from back in 1961, which caused damage to several homes and businesses. However, residents say they still plan to take beta seriously. Reporting here in Port O'Connor, Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Stephen. Looking outside with live cam, kind of hard to tell but we had a big increase in cloud cover this evening and there are even a couple of light showers moving through portions of San Antonio and Bear County tonight. Our temperature in the mid 70s. Uh, I do want to get you the very latest on what's going on with beta. Latest update from the Hurricane Center as of 10 p.m. does keep the system as a tropical storm and it's expected to stay that way uh, throughout the night and into the day tomorrow. That's actually kind of better news for us. A weaker system such as a tropical storm staying a bit more disorganized will do more to toss us some rain here in San San Antonio. So uh, that is a little bit of good news there. Beta moving off to the west northwest uh, at just about six miles per hour. That slow motion is going to continue as well, and that will aid in some very heavy rain across portions of southeast Texas, even a little bit of flooding possible over the next couple of days. We'll take a look at a closer look at beta and a uh, look at radar here in town coming up in just a bit. Courtney. Thank you so much, Katie. Well, in August, the city of San Antonio declared racism a public health crisis. Through the declaration, though the declaration doesn't make any immediate changes, it recognizes the issue at hand and commits to advocating for racial justice. San Antonio is hardly the first city to make such a move. According to the American Public Health Association, upwards of 80 states, cities, and counties have made similar declarations. In order to understand what this means and what the next steps are here at home, it's important to take a look back at how this movement began. The night team's Patty Santos has the story. Chronic exposure to toxic stress over the life course, including racism, negatively impacts health. Robin Langton is the president-elect of the Wisconsin Public Health Association. Following a state summit on health equity, the WPHA became the first organization to officially pass a resolution declaring racism a public health crisis in 2018. We felt it was really important to acknowledge that racism is a determinant of health and racism is really contributing to differences in health all the way from low birth weight babies to chronic health conditions to early death and mortality. Part of that resolution was a commitment to action. It's one thing to release a statement, but words aren't enough. In order to move forward, health officials took a step back. One thing that's been really important is to look at data and break it down by race and ethnicity so that we can even identify where are there differences in health outcomes, where are there differences in experiences, and then use that to drive the action planning. Similar steps have been taken in Milwaukee County, one of the first to follow the lead of the WPHA by not only making their own declaration, but taking immediate action. We had thousands of, of our employees 
uh, begin racial, racial equity training um, here at the county. David Crowley is the county's executive. Our mission here at Milwaukee County literally, literally is by achieving racial equity, Milwaukee is the healthiest county in the nation. But the road ahead is long. Currently, Milwaukee County ranks 71 out of the 72 healthiest counties in Wisconsin. In order to reach its goal, Crowley says the county needs to make changes across the board, starting with a budget. We created a budgeting racial equity tool. So each department has to use this tool to make sure that we want to put our money where our mouth is, to where we're not you know, making cuts or making investments. One of those investments include using CARES Act dollars to prevent evictions. So here we've put about $10 million, particularly towards eviction prevention, and it has helped out more people of color than anybody, particularly women of color with children. Housing inequity being one of the many issues the coronavirus pandemic has shed new light on. It was extremely important to have people of color at the table because at, at the beginning, there was it was called safer at home. And well, safer at home for who, right? Because I think about when I was growing up, it wasn't safe for me to be at home. And the pandemic, not the only recent event impacting the health of people of color. Because of what happened with George Floyd, what we've been seeing here now with Jacob Blake, more and more communities now want to have the conversation about how do we really tackle this. Since making their declarations, both Langton and Crowley agree community engagement is critical to solving this crisis. You have to talk to your residents, you have to talk to the people that live in your community and find out from them what's going on and how are they being impacted. And you need to trust the people who are most impacted by racism to identify the solutions. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. And this story, just part one of our examination of racism as a public health crisis. On Tuesday night, we'll hear from those impacted by this crisis right here at home and what the possible next steps are for the city of San Antonio. Still ahead on the night beat, as the remembrances for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg continue, a political battle already underway on who should have the right to name her replacement on the nation's highest bench. We'll have that story next. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. As mourners gather to pay tribute to Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, President Trump is promising quick action to fill her seat on the high court. But Alaska Senator Lisa Murkowski, among the Republicans who have said they will not support a vote on Trump's nominee to fill Justice Ginsburg's seat. Here's ABC's Rachel Scott with the latest. Hundreds of mourners gathering to honor the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg as the battle over who will fill her seat heats up. I don't think that pivoting to politics in this moment when everyone is still grieving so quickly is um, humane, but then none of us should be surprised at that. The somber scene outside the Supreme Court, a stark contrast to last night's Trump rally in North Carolina. President Trump saying he expects to announce his nominee soon. I think the process can go very, very fast. I'll be making my choice soon. Sources tell ABC News three female judges are on his short list, with conservative judge Amy Coney Barrett as an early front runner. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell already promising the president's choice will get a vote on the floor of the Senate. Joe Biden with a decidedly different opinion. Please follow your conscience. Don't vote to confirm anyone nominated under the circumstances President Trump and Senator McConnell have created. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi not taking anything off the table to stop a nomination before the election. We have arrows in our quiver that I'm not about to discuss right now. Uh, but the fact is we have a big challenge in our country. This president has threatened to not even accept the results of the election. Republicans can only afford to lose three votes, and a small group of moderate and vulnerable senators could split from their party, some already speaking out against the speedy timeline. One of them, Senator Susan Collins, in a statement saying, I do not believe the Senate should vote on the nominee prior to the election. Republicans will now have to figure out if they have enough votes in the Senate to confirm that nominee by Election Day, but it would have to move at a rapid pace. On average, it takes about 70 days for a nomination to get through the Senate, and we are less than 45 days out from Election Day. Rachel Scott, ABC News, Washington.
Well, with the summer and spring we've had, I feel like we deserve some of the weather we're getting, finally. <laughs> it feels like fall is kicking in just in time. Yes. My wife and I were out doing stuff earlier today and we weren't sweating. I said, I think we survived another summer. Right, right. It was yeah. so nice this weekend, but things really changed quickly this evening. We pulled in a lot of cloud cover after a whole lot of sunshine the past couple of days. Things are cloudy out across much of South Texas tonight. We're even reading a little bit of rain at the airport. Temperatures in the mid 70s. We've got a couple of very light light showers pacing in uh, moving in from the east here. Uh, this rain was a bit better organized a couple hours ago off between San Antonio and Houston. It's fallen apart a bit as it's made some westward progress, but this is kickstarting a couple of days of rain chances for us because of beta still centered out in the Gulf. Nonetheless, beta circulation tossing some showers into our area and even a few showers off closer to the Houston area. A lot of the deeper moisture still out in the Gulf. So latest update from the Hurricane Center movement is west northwest at just six miles per hour. So it has finally begun its westward movement today after being pretty stationary uh, during the day on Saturday, and it's about 100 miles or so off the Texas coastline, and it uh, is going to pick up more of a northwesterly movement tonight and during the day tomorrow. But forward speed is not forecast to increase very much at all. So by tomorrow morning, center of circulation still offshore. Landfall is expected sometime late tomorrow afternoon. Looks like a little before seven o'clock there with winds around 50 miles per hour. That's going to be near Port O'Connor and the Port Lavaca area. Then look what happens as we get into Tuesday. So a whole 24 hours here, not a whole lot of movement at all. So the system will continue to weaken as it moves farther inland once it loses. Um, the moisture of the Gulf of Mexico, but it's again not going to move very fast. That's going to be what we remember with this system is it just has crawled pretty much its whole lifetime. So even as we get into late Tuesday and Wednesday, moisture still lingering over portions of southeast Texas, but it is going to be southeast Texas, the Houston Galveston areas that end up seeing the most rain with this system, but that doesn't mean we won't see any rain at all. I do want to point out, though, that our easternmost counties, places like Lavaca County, Hallettsville, down to Quero and Goliad, you guys are looking at the highest rainfall totals through Wednesday. Anywhere from about three to six inches of rain possible for you. As you move further west, rainfall totals do drop off, but in and around San Antonio and Bear County, up to Kamau County, down to Carnes County as well. One to two inches of rain, not out of the question, but again, that's going to be through several days here through Wednesday evening. If you're well west of 35, you're looking at maybe a quarter to a half inch of rain. And again, that's going to be because as beta moves inland, the deeper moisture, the more widespread rain is generally going to stay off to the east of the I-35 corridor. Futurecast, I think, is painting a pretty good picture of what we're going to see here. Uh, we're going to see some off and on light shower activity for the next couple of days. So this is not going to be uh, pouring rain all day tomorrow. This is going to be periods of off and on light shower activity with some heavier rain again east to 35 for our easternmost counties there. Even as we get into Tuesday with beta hanging out over southeast Texas, we'll hold on to a chance of some light showers, but late Tuesday into Wednesday, that's when things will start to clear up and warm back up as well. So uh, if you like the cooler days here, cooler gray days, I think you'll like tomorrow. Again, notice chances of rain throughout the day, but that doesn't mean it will be raining all day off and on showers tomorrow to help limit our temperatures to the mid to upper 70s. Something else to note tomorrow, our wind gusts will really start to pick up. We're looking at some wind gusts up to 30, 35 miles per hour at times on Monday. So keep that in mind a little bit, a uh, little bit gusty here and there. The off and on shower activity continues into Tuesday and then it'll be pretty warm again as we head into next weekend. Guys, a little wind is worth it. Oh yeah. Thank you. We'll be back right after this. All right, the Dallas Cowboys snatching victory from the jaws of defeat in their home opener. With more on that and what's on instant replay tonight, let's check in with our Greg Simmons. Nearly a disaster today. Never thought they were going to be able to do that. And you know the Cowboy players saved Mike McCarthy a lot of grief this week for some bad calls. And more troubles for the Texans in their home opener against the Ravens coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. Yeah, this is huge. Um, Coach McCarthy said at halftime, uh, we need to be here. We need to be right where we are. And he said the final score didn't matter as much as uh, finding out the, the type of men that we have, the type of fight that we have within this team. 
All right, Dallas appear to be doomed to start their 2020 season down 0-2 after turning the ball over three times and going down by as many as 20 points in the first quarter to the Atlanta Falcons, but three rushing touchdowns by Dak Prescott and a major Falcons blunder on special teams put the Cowboys in position for a comeback victory, and they seize the moment. We got all the highlights. We'll take you inside the Cowboys' winning locker room. Kicks in the fake. Short toss. Ricard. Touchdown. The Houston Texans had their work cut out for them in their home opener in front of a vacant NRG stadium. They would have to find a way to beat Baltimore or the favorites to represent the AFC this season in the Super Bowl. But the Texans could not stop the dual threat quarterback Lamar Jackson. We will show you. And who had the best pass, the best run, and the best play in week four of the high school football season? We will show you in the best of big game coverage. And with some of the 6A and 5A schools set to kick off this week, we unveil our preseason picks in 12's top 12 and run down our sub 5A poll as well. Who is number one? Find out in just a few minutes. All that plus UTSA Roadrunners open their season 2-0. And what did Dallas have to overcome the most to pull out a win against Atlanta today? Tonight, you decide. Instant replay is live, and it's after the night beat. Had to overcome just about everything. everything. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Sure. More night beat right after this. As the U.S. reaches a grim milestone in the coronavirus pandemic, a somber tribute at the National Cathedral to the lives lost. Here's ABC's Andrew Dimbert with the details. At the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., the bell tolling 200 times Sunday afternoon, once for every thousand lives lost to the coronavirus in the United States as the country nears that grim milestone. President Trump offering an ambitious timeline for a vaccine. Hundreds of millions of doses will be available every month, and we expect to have enough vaccines for every American by April. Saying his administration will begin distributing the vaccine within 24 hours of its approval, but many may not want it. A new ABC News Ipsos poll showed 53% of Americans surveyed have no confidence at all in President Trump to confirm the safety and effectiveness of a potential coronavirus vaccine. Meanwhile, schools and universities continue to struggle with getting students back to class safely. Parents in Massachusetts furious after a student who tested positive for COVID-19 returned to school. This one was an egregious violation of the rules. 30 other students from the school now quarantined. Like, it's just really frustrating. I feel like I'm threatening my family's health. In Utah, which just recorded a new record daily case total, one high school reporting 40 positive cases, 500 students in quarantine. The American Academy of Pediatrics now with new guidance, recommending in part student athletes who show COVID symptoms get an electrocardiogram to determine heart health before being cleared to play. And as Hawaii prepares to reopen to visitors, residents are frustrated with confusing COVID COVID-19 restrictions that have resulted in police issuing 10,000 citations in one week. I've received complaints from even lawyers who couldn't understand what they were allowed to do and what they were prohibited from doing. Andrew Dimbert, ABC News, Washington. Take a look at stories around America tonight. An investigation is underway after a deputy with the King County Sheriff's Office in Washington State shot and killed a 32-year-old man in Auburn yesterday. The King County Sheriff's Office says it was around 3 p.m. when someone told a deputy a man was firing a gun in the backyard of a nearby home. The Sheriff's Office says a deputy went to that home where some sort of altercation between the deputy and the man, later identified as Joshua Sarrett, took place. It's unclear what happened at this time, and the sheriff's office says details are limited, but moments later, the deputy shot the man. They killed him for no reason. They didn't have to shoot at him. He, they said his pocket looked heavy, he had a clip in it. They shot him here, here, here. He was bleeding out, and they handcuffed him. My daughter told him to stop that he was dead. Authorities say they don't know whether the man had a weapon on him when he was killed. The deputy who shot Sarrett is uh, now on administrative leave pending an investigation. Another deadly shooting involving a police officer happening in Brunswick, Georgia this weekend. Police there say a 33-year-old man was shot and killed by police after he fired shots at officers while running away from them. Police say the incident began after an officer patrolling downtown spotted a speeding vehicle. While looking for that vehicle, officers say they found a man on foot who started running from them. Officers chased him, and that's when the man fired back towards them, prompting them to return fire. The suspect later died at a hospital from his wounds. No police were hurt, and the incident is now under investigation. Federal judge is blocking President Trump's ban on WeChat for now. The temporary block 
on the president's executive order to effectively shut down the popular app was issued today. The Commerce Department had issued restrictions against both TikTok and WeChat, citing national security issues. But the judge said Sunday the ban represents a violation of free speech and the Trump administration did not provide enough evidence to address national security concerns. The judge said there are other ways to complete such a ban, like barring WeChat from government devices. Another look outside with live cam. A lot of cloud cover started to move in late this afternoon, early this evening. Temperatures are in the mid-70s, and we've even got a little very light rain out across portions of Bear County tonight. And this kicks off a couple days of chances of showers for us here due to Tropical Storm Beta. A lot of this rain is starting to fizzle out, but you may be hearing a little bit of light rain where you are between Mont Ormy and Somerset. A very small shower there. Some light rain over closer to 281 in Mitchell Lake. Some light shower activity near Lackland. Similar story up near Leon Valley and Halota. So I can't rule out some more light passing showers tomorrow morning morning, getting everyone out the door and also tomorrow afternoon as everyone's coming home. Some off and on light showers are in the cards tomorrow and also into Tuesday. Heaviest rain, potentially flooding rain will be possible well to the east of San Antonio, but Hallettesville, Quero, Goliad, you are under a flash flood watch until Tuesday evening because you are looking at the highest rainfall totals as far as the KSAT viewing area is concerned. We'll get you ready for the next couple of days and check on Tropical Storm Beta once again coming up in just a little bit. Courtney. Thank you, Katie. Well, it is something that affects us all, transportation. This Thursday on our weekly digital program, KSAT Explains, we're continuing our conversation about transit here in San Antonio. Here's Myra Arthur with the preview. It is so often a challenge for major cities, but a particular struggle for San Antonio, how to improve transportation. If you were to ask somebody, well, tell me the most important things for the success of your city, they would say economics and jobs, education, good housing, crime measures, quality of life. They might never mention transportation, but transportation is inherent in all of those things. Especially for a city expected to grow by 1 million more people in the next 20 years. So if you want to envision what our streets and transportation network would look like, if all that Austin traffic was in San Antonio on top of what we have today, there are plans in the works to try to keep us all moving, but not everyone is on board. Texans don't like to be forced into stuff. You know, they like choices. They like their cars. They like the independence. Getting where we need to go means so much more than just easing traffic congestion. It increases um, air quality problems that lead to uh, lung disease and cancers and heart disease. Add in a global pandemic, and now our city is being forced to look at even more possible resources to reroute the direction in which we're all headed. If we're serious about recovery, if we're serious about workforce development and economic mobility, then we have to start being serious about transportation. So what could the future of transit look like in our city, and how will that future be funded? KSAT explains part two of Transportation in SA. Still ahead, we'll introduce you to a woman who not only manages to save dogs from being put down, but pairs them with a forever partner in need. What's up, South Texas, next. Saving two lives at once. That's the mission of one South Texas woman who's helped rescue hundreds of dogs by training them as service animals for veterans in need. Her name is Cherry Jenkins, and she is next on What's Up, South Texas. The night team's Jaffney Gray shares her story. When I first met, married my husband, he said, you can have one dog. We now have seven. <laughs> Growing up in England, 60-year-old Sherry Jenkins walked four miles every Sunday to volunteer at an animal shelter starting at age eight. I would go up and help bathe them and put little red ribbons around their neck and things to get them adopted. She later met the American love of her life, which brought her to the United States in 2008. I married my husband after meeting a very traditional way online. Um. <laughs> While in America working with animal control services, Sherry learned something. They'd seen so many veterans bringing dogs back to the shelter because they were rescuing dogs, going to a trainer and then finding that the dog wasn't suitable. She soon found a way to rescue death row dogs while helping veterans with PTSD at the same time. In 2012, she found it in Dog We Trust. 
With each dog, there's a veteran. For every veteran, there's a dog. It's just our job is to make sure that we match them correctly. Sherry assesses and trains dogs to be a perfect fit for specific veterans with disabilities or different forms of PTSD. A fear of crowds, a fear of uh, great people, a fear of loud noises, a fear of being asleep. The dogs are mostly protective breeds, like pit bulls. They're not as vicious and nasty as, as everybody thinks that they are. To date, Sherry has rescued and matched at least 300 dogs said to be euthanized with veterans. I do it because I've saved the life of a dog um, that would otherwise have been killed. And I do it to give back to my country that has given me the grace to live here. The experience, both emotionally rewarding and in honor of her father who passed away two years ago. He taught me a lot about uh, animals, um, or at least compassion with animals. Things have slowed down after her husband was diagnosed with stage four prostate cancer and after the pandemic struck. However, Sherry says she will push through the trials in order to save two lives at once. That's a major salute for What's Up South Texas. Today is all you have. Today is what anybody is ha it has. So if you're worried about tomorrow, you're wasting today. Jeffany Gray, KSAT 12 News. The North American box office still struggling as many theaters remain closed in New York, Los Angeles, and in other cities. But some movies are making some money. Your weekend box office report is next. Max broke up with me. Pay up. Hey, what's going on here? We bet on all your relationships. The rom-com The Broken Hearts Gallery slipped to fifth place in its second weekend, grossing $800,000. Ma'am, are you okay? I'm pretty sure the guy in that truck's following me. He's road raging. After a month in theaters, Unhinged is still in the top five, taking fourth place with $1.3 million. You started this. We're going to finish it. The religious political thriller Infidel, starring Jim Caviezel, debuted in third place, earning one and a half million. What's the last thing you remember, Danny? The New Mutants hung on in second place. $1.6 million gave the X-Men spin-off a domestic total of nearly 18 million. All I have for you is a word. Three straight weekend titles for Tenet, which made $4.7 million. Christopher Nolan's latest thriller has grossed more than $250 million worldwide, though just $36 million in North America. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. I saw that movie like three weeks ago, and I still don't know what happened. <laughs> I was just thinking by the totals, clearly still not a lot of people going to the movies. Yeah. And if you did this weekend in San Antonio, you really wasted a great weekend. <laughs> I know. There. It was so nice outside. I, I see that your fall the, stuff the, the is Halloween starting to happen. Is the starting Halloween. to come out of storage, oh, yes. Yeah. I'm so excited. <laughs> spooky season is right around the corner. Uh, so at the start of spooky season kind of runs into the end of hurricane season. That is definitely still happening, and we're going to have some kind of active weather the next couple of days, especially the farther east you are from San Antonio. Flash flood watches out for our easternmost counties, Lavaca, DeWitt, and Goliad counties. This is until Tuesday evening, so what this means, if you see it on your weather app or something like that, uh, it means localized flash flooding issues will be possible because you guys are looking at the highest rainfall totals through the middle of the week, anywhere from about three to six inches of rain. Meanwhile, you come farther west, those rainfall totals drop off not as conducive to flooding issues here in San Antonio up to New Braunfels. We are looking at between one and two inches of rain through Wednesday evening from some light showers that are going to pace in thanks to tropical storm beta temperature wise right now. Most of us are in the 70s. We've got a few spots in the hill country dropping into the upper 60s. Look at these numbers. Our dew point numbers were lower this weekend. That's why it felt so nice out there. And if you're west of 35, you're still hanging on to some drier air dew points in the 40s and 50s. But look what's happening. East of the interstate, tropical moisture building in. These dew point numbers are going up. So even if you step outside right now, it feels a lot more humid here in San Antonio than it did for most of the weekend. So the humidity is going to build back in.
overnight. As far as our winds go, they're out of the north. That's the circulation around Beta that's still centered in the Gulf. Uh, winds are starting to pick up a touch 14 miles per hour in Victoria, 12 miles per hour here in San Antonio, and it's going to get pretty gusty at times during the day on Monday. We're looking at our wind gusts up to between about 30, maxing out around 35 at times tomorrow. Our sustained winds will be 10 to 20 miles per hour, but again, some higher gusts will be possible, but that's going to be fairly tame compared to what's going to go on in the Houston area and down closer to the central and northern Gulf Coast as beta starts to push closer to the Gulf Coast tomorrow. So anywhere you see yellow, those are tropical storm force winds, sustained winds, 40 to 55 miles per hour, even a little pocket of some high end tropical storm force winds. Uh, they're closer to where the center of beta will make landfall tomorrow afternoon. So that's where we're looking at tropical storm force winds. Notice that is well east of San Antonio. So while it will be gusty here, uh, um, it's going to be certainly a lot more windy well off to the east, closer to where Beta makes landfall. So tropical storm warnings, along with those flash flood warnings, are out for our easternmost counties, Lavaca County, down to Goliad. You guys are looking at sustained winds 30 to 40 miles per hour, and then some gusts up to about 50 miles per hour. That will be possible during the day tomorrow into Tuesday morning. Uh, so be prepared for that. Again, our easternmost counties will really kind of feel the brunt of this the next couple of days. Here's the movement west northwest at six miles per hour. The center there is moving into the western Gulf and this westward motion will continue tonight and during the day tomorrow. So even by tomorrow morning, center is still offshore, but landfall is expected sometime later in the day tomorrow down near Port Lavaca and Port O'Connor there and then kind of really pumps the brakes here. So 12 hours from Monday at 7 p.m. to Tuesday at 7 a.m. Not a whole lot of movement here. And then continued slow movement off to the northeast, closer to the Houston area as we get into late Tuesday, early Wednesday. So the slow motion contributing to those big time uh, rainfall totals that will pop up again well to our east, closer to the Houston area. Here in town, we're painting you a gray day tomorrow, but it's off and on light showers. Not going to be raining all day long, but we will uh, certainly have some light showers pacing through. Those rain chances will linger into Tuesday, and then we will dry out and warm up by the middle of the week. Looks like good fall weather to me. Oh, yeah. We'll be right back. Stay with us. UTSA Roadrunners have kicked off their 2020 season by going 2-0 on national TV. Yeah, the San Antonio FC ends their home season undefeated and are playoff bound all in the same week. Let's head to Greg Simmons to find out what's on Instagram. They've had a heck of a season. I hope yes. their playoff run is, yeah. is as successful. And world champion Mario Barrios has had his title defense postponed coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. He's going out there and winning. Uh, I know this is Coach Trailers. I'm a martyr, so I'm just uh, hyped up about him getting a win. And uh, we're just blessed to be 2-0. The UTSA Roadrunners have kicked off their 2020 season by going undefeated on national TV by beating new head coach Jeff Trailers alma mater, Stephen F. Austin, in their home debut. How did the Roadrunners pull it off? We will show you. And who takes a U.S. Open in New York? We've got that for you as well. It's happened so plenty of times. So, I mean, it's not something that's out of the ordinary. And um, I mean, so we just had to, you know, to uh, tone down camp for um, a couple of weeks, you know, pull back a little bit. World champion Mario Barrios will not be allowed to defend his title this Saturday, and the decision was not his. And he is he able to still train in California despite all the wildfires? He will tell us. And San Antonio FC is headed to the playoffs for the first time since 2017 after closing out their home season undefeated. All that plus, how did the Dallas Cowboys come back and win that game after being down by 20 points to the Falcons? We will show you. Instant replay is live, and it is next. And no team has ever been beaten that goes up that scores 39 points and has zero turnovers until today. Way to go, Bert. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Well, coming up, he co-wrote one of the decade's biggest hit songs, and now he's penning his own children's book. Tell me something good. It's next.